So how do you know if you have depression? I'm Dr. Julie and I'm going to give you a super quick rundown. So to be diagnosed with depression, you need to be presenting with at least five of these nine symptoms. Number one, persistently feeling down, low in mood or hopeless. Number two, having little or no interest or pleasure in doing things. Number three, disturbed sleep, either too much or too little compared to usual. Number four, changes in appetite and weight. You might be eating more or less than usual. Number five, fatigue and loss of energy. Even everyday tasks feel exhausting. Number six, agitation or slowing of movements. Number seven, poor concentration or indecisiveness. You might have trouble making even the smallest of daily decisions. Number eight, feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt over things that you might not normally feel so intensely about. Number nine, suicidal thoughts or urges. Now all of these symptoms can come and go, but for a diagnosis, five or more of those symptoms need to have been present for at least a couple of weeks. I'm Dr. Julie and here's three signs of high functioning anxiety. Number one, you experience high levels of anxiety, but that feeling tends to drive you forward. So you still meet everyone's expectations for you and they'd never know you experience so much fear. Number two, you function really well in day-to-day -day life. The problem comes when you have to slow down or stop and rest. You might be known to your friends as a workaholic. And number three, you appear calm on the outside, but you're constantly worrying and doubting yourself on the inside. Here's a tip from a psychologist. Just because someone is related to you, it does not mean they're any good for you. And it's okay to put boundaries into a relationship if it's damaging for your mental health, even if that person is in your family. It might not mean you want to end the relationship, you might just want to put some boundaries in. Check this out, this could be the most important video you see today. I want you to imagine that this rice represents the population of the world. The brown rice represents those people who will never experience a mental health problem. And the wild rice represents the one in four of us who will at some point in our lifetime experience a mental health problem. Let's just mix that up. Now when you have a mental health problem, your mind convinces you that you are the only one. But let's just take a pinch. That represents your family. This one's your friends and some work colleagues. It's a natural part of being human. So whether you're with your family, your friends, or your colleagues, the likelihood is a few of those people at some point in their lives are also gonna struggle with their mental health. So even if you're not struggling, the chances are you're gonna brush shoulders with someone who is. So be kind. Like this, share it, and follow for more. When emotions hit you, it's like ink pouring into water. It quickly gets more and more intense until you can't really see anything else clearly. Everything in your life is suddenly tainted with that feeling you don't want to have. You can't escape from it, you just want it to go away. People come to therapy thinking that someone is gonna teach them how to escape from it. But in fact, what you learn is how to allow it to be there. Welcome it even, to pay attention to it and see it for what it is. The ink is not the water, and the emotion is not you. It's an experience, a sensation moving through you. And when you allow emotion to be there without trying to block it out or make it go away, then you allow it to take its natural course. So over time, the emotion passes and you're ready for whatever comes next. I'm a psychologist, follow for more. Here's four signs that a friendship may be coming to an end. Number one, you don't feel safe to be yourself around them anymore. Maybe you feel the need to present a past version of yourself because they judge or disagree with how you've changed and grown over time. Number two, the friendship depletes you rather than nourishes you. Maybe you feel a sense of dread before meeting up or you feel the need to vent about that friendship to other people because it's not the kind of friendship where you can talk openly about how you feel. Number three, what you're looking for from friendships has changed over time and you've grown to realize that other friendships you have are much healthier and more fulfilling for you. And number four, there's just no longer that connection you once had. The values and priorities have moved in different directions and you just don't feel drawn to each other in the way that you once were. Here's three ways that past trauma can show up in your present. Number one is explosions of anger that seem to come out of nowhere. And not just a bit of anger, but so intense that it feels out of proportion to the thing that triggered it. Number two, it takes constant effort to push painful memories to the back of your mind. But as soon as you let your guard down, those memories come out of nowhere, hit you so hard, you can barely function. And number three, the withdrawal. When things get too much, the emotional shutters come down and nobody can connect with you, not even you. You feel numb to the world. Now imagine this is you, and these are all the bad things that have happened to you. So each one represents a memory 
of traumatic experiences that you've been through. And as you go about your life, the thing seems like it's overflowing. Memories just keep falling out when you don't want them to, emotionally overwhelming you, and you can't seem to focus on the rest of your life. So what can we do about it? Well, I'm a psychologist, and this is what happens in trauma therapy. First of all, a therapist would gear you up with all the skills that you need to manage just how painful those memories can be. And then you take one memory at a time, carefully open it up at your own pace, and allow you to process that memory. And then you can neatly fold it up. You do the same with the next one and the next one until what you're left with is a neat little pile of memories that fit neatly at the bottom, leaving you more capacity to focus on the life that you want to have today. Don't make this mistake when you're working on your own happiness. Imagine this is you and this is your life. But like most people's lives, there are problems that can make it toxic. If a fish is living in a toxic environment, eventually it gets sick. So you take her out of the dirty water and put her in a new tank for a while. Kind of like how you take a break, you go on a holiday for a few weeks into a new environment and it helps, everything gets better and feels great for a while until you return and go right back to that toxic situation again. And it doesn't matter how clean the water was on your break or how refreshed you feel, eventually you will get sick again. If you want to thrive in the long term, you have to focus on cleaning up the environment that is affecting you every day. I'm a psychologist, follow for more. If you're struggling with low mood and that feeling of, I can't be bothered with anything right now, I wanna share something with you that I often talk to people about in therapy, and that's about how low mood will give you the urge to do all the things that are going to keep you stuck and make your mood even worse. So let's say you wake up in the morning and you just don't feel good. The natural urge is to stay in bed, cancel your plans, just hide away from the world. And sometimes you need that, right? But the problem is it's addictive because as soon as you decide to do that, you get this instant relief, like, phew, I don't have to face the world today. But the longer you stay hidden for, the more time you spend ruminating, thinking over and over the things that make you feel worse. And that ruminating is a powerful predictor of depression. Imagine this blue ball is that person in your life that's no good for you. You know the one, every time you see them you come away feeling a little bit worse. And you might have one in your life, or you might have loads. But there are other people in your life too. The green balls are those people that add something special to your life and bring out the best in you. Now here's the mistake most people make. See the urge is to get rid of these people from our lives altogether, but it's not always that simple. So what we do is we let everyone in and just accept the damage they can do. But these aren't the only options. You can put in some boundaries. You create an inner circle, a safe space. Everyone in here gets most of your time and attention. But if you allow everyone in here, it doesn't leave much room for the people who make your life better. So you have the power to decide who's in and who's out. Tag someone special who gets to be in here. You know how with a Chinese finger trap, the most natural response is to pull away, right? But when you do, the trap tightens and it becomes impossible to escape. Well, something I talk to people about in therapy is that dealing with painful feelings is much the same. So let's say you feel anxious, you escape and then avoid the things that make you feel anxious so that you can feel safe. Or when you're overwhelmed with a deep sadness, you might stay busy or eat or drink to block it out. When you do that, the emotion that you're trying to escape tightens its grip on your life because then you have to make your decisions based on the things you don't want to feel. But something people learn in therapy is that when we turn towards those feelings and we're willing to be in that space, then the trap widens and you get this wiggle room. Then you get to choose when to be with that feeling and when to step away from it without having to fight your way free. If you find it hard to set boundaries with other people, here's one thing that might be holding you back. You see it as all or nothing. Either you put everyone else first, or you put you first. And putting yourself first feels too selfish to bear. So your default is to put them first. But having healthy boundaries doesn't mean you have to stop caring about other people's needs. It just means you have to start treating your own as equal to theirs. 
If you learned as a child that it was your responsibility to prevent the people in your life from feeling upset or disappointed, then as an adult, saying no to something in order to meet your own needs is going to bring up feelings of intense guilt. And when we feel that guilt, we assume that it must be because we're doing something wrong, when in fact those feelings can be a reflection of the past experience, not what's best for us now. When you need to set a boundary and say no, but it feels uncomfortable to do that, you might notice that you go into people-pleasing mode and you start to over-explain why you can't do something. This happens when you believe that your own health is not a good enough reason to disappoint other people. But all that over-explaining yourself chips away at your self-confidence because it reconfirms your belief that other people need to buy into those reasons for them to be valid. If you want to build your confidence, I'm a psychologist and here's three tips to start you off. Number one, take action. You can't convince yourself to feel more confident by just thinking about it or talking about it. Your brain learns through experience, so you have to start doing the thing that you want to feel more confident in. Number two, accept that you're not going to suddenly feel confident overnight. Be willing to feel vulnerable when you start out and trust that it builds over time. And number three, avoidance feeds anxiety. So if you want to feel more confident at something, do it as often as you possibly can. Quick tip from a psychologist. When you set a boundary in a relationship, that other person has a right not to like it. And they probably won't, but that doesn't make you wrong for setting the boundary. If you have to betray yourself in order to be liked by someone else, then it's not a healthy relationship. Here's something people learn in therapy. Boundaries is not about getting other people to like your decisions. Healthy boundaries is about making your own decisions based on your own best interests, but accepting that other people have a right not to like it. Here's three signs you're gaslighting yourself. Number one, you blame yourself for everything. You'll make excuses for other people's behavior, but if you make a mistake, you believe it says something fundamental about who you are as a person. Number two, you never trust in your own judgment, but you see the opinions of other people as a much more credible source. So you live in an almost constant state of self-doubt and you look to other people for clarity. Number three, you invalidate or ignore your own feelings because you come to believe that you're oversensitive or you overreact. So you don't know which emotions to listen to anymore. Depression's not always obvious. Sometimes it's invisible. Even if those people around you can't see your pain and they can't understand it that pain is still real it's still happening for you and it needs as much attention as any physical pain if you want to build your confidence here's something people learn in therapy that can be life-changing now everyone has a comfort zone right those situations that feel easy and safe and everyone thinks that everything outside of that comfort zone is overwhelming and frightening. Let's call that the panic zone. What if I told you that there's a third zone, the stretch zone? Now these are all the things that feel like a challenge but doable with some effort. And when you spend time in that stretch zone, you start doing all those small things that challenge you, what happens is comfort zone starts to expand so you can build your confidence without ever having to step into your panic zone you don't have to overwhelm yourself but you do have to challenge yourself every day in that stretch zone over and over again it takes courage but the more time you spend there the more confident you become I'm a psychologist and here's four signs you're being manipulated. Number one, they undermine you relentlessly or get you right where it hurts with a very personal attack and then follow up with something like, I'm just saying, don't overreact. Not just once, but repeatedly over time. Number two, they do things for you, maybe even things you didn't even ask for, and then use that as currency to get you to do what they want you to do. So every act of kindness seems to have strings attached. Number three, they might dismiss your problems and play up their own with things like, oh, you think you've got it bad, try being me. Number four, playing the victim role. They refuse to take responsibility for themselves and then ask you to do things for them that you wouldn't normally say yes to if you thought they could do it for themselves.